and welcome to Forgotten America, a podcast about the many places that get flown over, driven past, or just plain forgotten, and the people who call these places home. In each episode, we'll diagnose the unique challenges faced by rural America and unpack and explore the solutions to those challenges. We'll also share the culture, stories, and perspectives of Forgotten Americans, from the hilltop to the holler and the desert to the delta. president of the Kansas Policy Institute, joins Garrett to explore the Sunflower State. Garrett and James discuss everything from the appropriate degree of doneness for a stake to Kansas tax reform. We learn that even flat Kansas has elevations to rival the mountain state, and we dive into local Swedish art, the demographics of Kansas, increasing mechanization's impacts on the local economy, and Trump's legacy in the Great Plains. All right, welcome back, everyone, to another edition of Forgotten America. And today we have with us James Franco, president of the Kansas Policy Institute. James, welcome to Forgotten America. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Lest we be forgotten and fly over country here in Kansas, um, it is uh, a joy uh, to be able to talk to another part of uh, Forgotten America. If I may be so bold as to suggest that West Virginia uh, is forgotten. Oh, it is. It is. And to the extent that it's not forgotten, it's often targeted. And so I'm not sure which we would prefer, but we'll go with forgotten as it is the title of the podcast. So I I tell you what, James, for the folks that that aren't super familiar with Kansas or they've never driven across Kansas, explain Kansas. Give us a one to two minute explainer on the state of Kansas. Right. So Kansas, uh, most people, when they think of it, if they think of it, they think of uh, the basketball team of the University of Kansas um, or mistakenly think that the Kansas City Royals or the Kansas City Chiefs actually play in Kansas. They don't. They play in Missouri. Um, We entered the Union in 1861 with a history just before that of kind of bleeding Kansas. Um, as to whether or not we would enter the union as a free or a slave state. And that has defined a good deal of our politics ever since in lots of different ways. And we're, we're overwhelmingly a, a very rural state geographically, 105 counties, but you know, it's dominated by the Kansas city Metro area um, on our Eastern flank. Um, and then a whole lot of rural and agricultural parts of the state in the West Um as you butt up against uh, Colorado and our biggest city still to this day is Wichita, even though again, kind of the Kansas city area uh, dominates the state, very ag heavy um, as one might expect, you know, we're one of the largest wheat producers in the country have been for a long, long time and uh, continue to be so uh, to this day. Now I usually do this at the end of the podcast, but since we're kind of discussing in these terms, if you were going to do a 60 minute recruiting pitch, to the average listener about why they should move to Kansas, what would your pitch be? The 60-second pitch, that's a good question. It's a good thing I'm not in our tourism or commerce department, I guess. Um, I have not <laughs> thought about it a whole lot. Um, well, you ended up there, right? So you're, are yeah, you, you're from but, Kansas originally, right? I, I am from Kansas. So I was born and raised here. I went to Kansas State University. Um, I caught Potomac fever and lived back in D.C. for six years. But my wife and I are both uh, from here. So it was only natural that we would relocate, you know, kind of back to here, having lived, you know, back East for, for a handful of years early in our li- uh, professional lives. I mean, the pitch to K- for Kansas is it is a, a wonderful place that just has access to a lot of different things. No, it doesn't have coasts or mountains, but, a, you know, and oceans, but a lot of those things are, are close to it. The benefit of being centrally located is that you have access to a lot of those things. The Kansas City metro area, which again is kind of half between Kansas and half between the state of Missouri, is a growing metropolitan area that has a lot of good things going for it. And especially in a post-COVID world, you can have access to, you know, big city metropolitan amenities in Kansas City or Wichita, but yet be rural enough that you have access to you know, the outdoors, whatever, you know, pursuits you have recreationally to do those kinds of different things. 
and be ready for, you know, whatever, you know, life throws at you next with kids. Or if not, you know, it's telecommuting and things like that, but you're still, again, close to those big enough cities that you can have uh, those things right there at your fingertips as well. Is there a food that defines Kansas? You know, like West Virginia, we are most synonymous with pepperoni rolls. I don't know if you've ever had the joy of eating a pepperoni roll. If you get one that is made appropriately, they are delicious. Is there something that you think kind of defines the the Kansan culinary experience? It's got to be beef. I mean, hands down. I know that a cow is a large animal um, with lots of different cuts of of it, but I mean, it's got to be beef. It is by far, you know, we're not a pork heavy agricultural area. It is a lot of farming, a lot of ranching, a lot of feedlots. So it's got to be, you know, a good KC strip steak if I had to narrow it down to one particular cut of uh, the bovine. Medium, medium rare, well done. What kind of aristocrat are you? So um, I am medium rare at the most. Um, If you're doing well done, barring any kind of religious restrictions for anybody who may be listening, um, you're, you're frankly, you're ruining that cut of meat. Uh, there's a farmer or a rancher who's worked very, very hard to get the appropriate marbling in that steak and roasting it to the point of uh, well done is nigh on a sin. So I, I medium rare at the most for me, but I understand that some people could go medium, uh, but anything more than that is, um, again, barring a religious restriction, um, is uh, problematic at best. Uh, a man after my own heart. I, my in-laws are all well done. And we were in Florida vacationing together earlier this year. And the guy that was grilling them out, my brother-in-law, he asked everybody how they wanted their steak. And everybody was either medium well or well done. He got to me. I said medium rare. And he goes, oh, we have an aristocrat. And so <laughs> I had no idea that was a kind of a, a class thing. Um, but anyway, we've got some more cultural and we've got some more culinary stuff at the end of this podcast. Yeah. Obviously, we are focused uh, probably 70% of the time on policy issues, particularly right. how they relate in its intersection with kind of flyover country. And so, James, just are there some unique policy areas or policy issues, whether it be in Kansas or kind of the broader Plains region of the United States that you guys focus on that you think is important to discuss? Yeah, absolutely. For us, th- it would not be dissimilar from what you've seen in other Plains states. Or I, I don't know enough about, you know, West Virginia's economy, but I would guess it's, it's somewhat similar to where the policy... Uh, let me back up a step. You know, it is the automization and the mechanization continues to drive a lot of, you know, rural America. And uh, in farming, right, you know, a generation ago, it would have, you know, the header on your combine to cut wheat or corn or soybeans or whatever would have been, you know, 10 or 12 feet. Now it's 30 feet or even more. And, you know, what that requires for labor and whatnot is is driving, a, you know, it on one hand, a depopulation of the plains themselves, while at the same time driving an urbanization of the plains. So our cities are getting bigger, but our rural counties are decreasing. So then to your question about policy-wise, be it healthcare, education, or infrastructure, you have communities that were, quote-unquote, built for a different generation or multiple generations ago with schools and hospitals and whatnot, with significantly larger populations. And now those populations are just not the same as they were, you know, 50 years ago, or in some cases, even a hundred years ago. And that's driving the policy debates in Kansas quite a bit, um, which then gets into that urban rural divide, which is probably something we'll talk about as well. So it is the size of government. And I don't mean that in an anti-government way. It's just, you know, we have the, the second highest rate of uh, local government employees in the country. And again, it's because of how these counties, these cities, these townships were built, you know, a hundred years ago. And we're still living with the legacy of those things today when the world is a very, very different place. That's fascinating. I did not know that. Do you happen to know what number one is? Is it another plain state? I don't know. I want to say it's South Dakota. I don't have, we have, we do a wonderful, uh, green book every year 
um, where we publish a lot of these data, but I don't actually have it opened up to that page in front of me and I'll spare your listeners me rifling through it. Um, I, I want to say it is one of the Dakotas, um, no, but, I makes, but, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, no, that makes a ton of sense. It, it, you know, whenever you started talking about ag and, and kind of the increased mechanization, one of the places that my mind automatically went, I don't know why, but was immigration. Is there a large Hispanic population within Kansas or the Greater Plains? And, you know, is it like a place like West Virginia where it's typically thought of as kind of a red state or maybe a, a, not a terribly inclusive state, but yet actually pretty friendly relations. People work in the coal mines together. They work elbow to elbow. They die in the coal mines together. And over the generations, it's actually inculcated a, a type of friendliness amongst all kinds of racial and ethnic groups. Do you see a similar phenomenon in Kansas as well? I, yes, I think so. So there is, um, we're about eight or nine percent Hispanic population in Kansas, um, and it. I mean, that's you know centered around a you know, of course, the bigger cities, Wichita, you know, Kansas City, Kansas, which is its own city, just again across the state line in 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 Kansas. But then we have what's out in Southwest Kansas called the Beef Triangle, and it is Garden City, Dodge City, and Liberal Kansas. Um, which is kind of the center of the beef and, you know, packing industry, which has a very large uh, Hispanic population. Um, and those counties, um, I don't know about all three of them, but at least a couple of them are uh, majority minority counties. Um, and then in some cases, there is actually some African population increases there from East Africa um, that have come in to work in those same uh, packing facilities as well. Um, so there is a a substantial Hispanic population. I mean, you, I mean, that's, you know, if you think of Kansas as, you know, as essentially a big long rectangle, it's also kind of fun to think about the different parts of the state, right? Where the Kansas city area again, feels almost more like a, an industrial Midwest town, whereas you get out in Southwest Kansas and it's always felt kind of Southwesty um, as well. I'm from the Kansas city or I married a, into a family of farmers from Southwest Kansas. So I, you know, have spread across the state, but uh, the short answer is yes, there's a large Hispanic population and it's the largest single minority group in Kansas um, as well as kind of, you know, some of those more um, previous waves of immigration across different parts of the uh, Eastern half of the state. Now I forgot about Dodge city being in Kansas. So if I may take a slight off ramp here, yeah. <laughs> Wyatt Earp, great American or greatest American? Um, great American, I guess, not greatest American. Um, uh, I, I don't think it's, a lot it's, of our listeners, they think of the Old West as Dakotas, right, New Mexico yeah. and Colorado, but like a lot of that was centered in Kansas. Right, it was, and it was, you know, a lot of the railheads um, when they were driving beef uh, cattle up from, you know, Texas. Uh, through parts of Kansas to the railheads and whatnot is, um, you know, a big, is a, is a big part of, of that history. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen either the Kevin Costner or, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the guy who was in Tombstone versions of Wyatt Earp. Um, but, you know, the, the, the billboards as we drive out to, you know, the family farm out West are still, you know, it's no longer get the hell out of Dodge. You know, they've got it crossed out and it says, get the heck into Dodge. And it's got, you know, they're still very much leaning into the Wyatt Earp ethos as, as, as their tourist attraction. The casino that's out there is called Boot Hill. You know, I mean, they're, they're very much leaning into that Western version of America. I love that. I've always just been a big fan of, of kind of Old West stuff. And we had a previous podcast guest, uh, PJ Hill, who wrote a pretty well-known book called The Not-So-Wild Wild West. Yes, I read the, the role of property rights in kind of maintaining a certain kind of law and order. And one of my favorite excerpts from that, that discussion where he talked about how we all have this sense that like bank robberies happen basically every other day in the wild, wild west. <laughs> and he kind of pushes back on that because his point was actually there are very, very few documented bank robberies. And the reason was is because if you went in there and you robbed a bank, the entire town would be out on their front porch waiting to shoot you as you tried to ride out. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. And so actually, it was kind of this really interesting discussion just around the role of, uh, 
you know, kind of what happens or what develops in, in the absence of a state and in the, in the kind of the, the capital S sense of the word. But anyway, let's get back on the highway here. Let's get back on this policy discussion. And I know you've probably had this discussion a billion times, but for those of us that haven't haven't heard too much about this or we've not delved into this, one of the very first things that inevitably comes up when you talk about Kansas is Kansas tax reform. Mm-hmm. And kind of the debacle that ensued, um, yeah. I believe it was under Governor Brownback. Can you just, James, walk us through what Kansas tax reform was, why it was important from a national perspective, and maybe some lessons that we can draw from that? Yeah, absolutely. The short answer is it, it is a poster child in what not to do when it comes to tax policy. Um, and it, it's very easy to cut taxes on one hand. At the state level, um, it's very, very difficult uh, to pay for them. And in most states, you know, the you can't, you don't have a Federal Reserve, you can't print money. So at least in theory, right, notwithstanding accounting gimmicks and whatnot, you have to balance revenue with spending. And if you don't have the the political will to address spending, then doing the easy stuff of cutting taxes makes it harder. So in 2012, went on a pretty uh, dramatic uh, called kind of the march to zero was the idea that eventually we would get to a zero state income tax for everybody. Uh, It went to zero immediately on kind of pass through entities, Uh, corporations, you know, big C Corp stuff didn't want anything to do with it. It turns out they kind of liked their credits more than they liked getting to zero. And then we lowered the rates on individuals, but then didn't do enough to address the spending side of the ledger. Um, We can talk more about that in detail, but half of our state budget is education and our state Supreme Court essentially serves as our appropriations committee when it comes to education. Um, So 50% of the budget was effectively off limits. Um, So then over the course of the next couple of years, we, you know, increase sales taxes and, and things of that nature to, you know, effectively blunt the benefit of, the income tax cuts themselves, um, while at the same time not doing enough to um, address the rest of the state spending ledger. You know, the economy was not doing well coming out of the Great Recession. The the general proposition is that if the East Coast or the West Coast catches the flu, maybe this analogy doesn't work as well given the COVID pandemic, but that America or that uh, Kansas catches you know a cold. So it always takes longer for those things to manifest themselves in Kansas. They did. Commodity prices were decreasing, you know, for our ag industry and whatnot. Um, so it was it was a real challenge, um, and it was a case study in what not to do. There are other states you can look to where they were able to lower taxes, get spending, you know, under control, you know, bend the curve, so to speak, on spending. But Kansas is a place where we did not do it well, and. We're now viewed as a poster child of, oh, no, you can't cut spending. Look, it wrecked the economy. And no, it didn't. The early returns on the economic side of things were good. Um, Not stellar, not a shot of adrenaline or something, but, you know, we're chipping away at economic growth. Um, We just didn't have the discipline or the will to address the spending side of the ledger. So explain for listeners why why it was important to at least try to tackle cutting income taxes, because I think... It's one of these things that's kind of bandied about. The left accuses the right always of, of this is kind of a trickle down economics or something like that. What was the impetus behind that push in particular in Kansas? And then maybe kind of broaden that out to why consumption taxes are better from an economic perspective than a, right. than a productivity tax. Right. So I am not the guy to take the second half of that and, you know, get into the dead weight losses of, uh, you know, taxing work versus taxing consumption and whatnot. Um, but the short version is, I mean, Kansas has had, you know, roughly four decades of economic stagnation, right, to where we're not seeing the same kind of growth that you are seeing um, in other parts of the country. And this is something that, you know, then manifests itself in other kind of political and cultural ways um, that maybe we can talk about a little bit. Um, but if you have four decades of economic at best stagnation, let alone actual declines, you got to do something to try to, you know, incentivize people to, to locate their business or to grow a business here. Um, and the things that had driven our economy around the state, you know, ag is always going to be there. 
Uh, but, you know, the aerospace industry in Wichita, where I sit right now, um, you know, was a legacy industry. So it was what was going to be the next wave of, of economic development. And those of us who talk about tax policy probably don't do a great job of, you know, making it sound, oh, it's we want to cut taxes. Well, yeah, we do. But the reason we want to is because of what that means for working families or small businesses. And it's about more economic opportunity. And the states that have the lowest tax rates are seeing the greatest economic growth. And that means more jobs for families. So it's more opportunities for us to, to live and work here and not have to worry about, you know, where my kids are going to go for them when it comes time for them to get jobs, right? If they want to start a business, it's going to be those lower tax rates are one of the biggest line items for them. And it's, can they start and grow a business here in the state of Kansas? So what, I know this is always a difficult question to answer because we're kind of generalizing a general population here. But if you if you just kind of pull the average West Virginian, for example, have a very negative attitude toward, towards D.C., generally because they're kind of reflecting the attitude that's given towards them. Um, it, it, just an example, you know, we, West Virginia tends to be the butt of a lot of late night comedian jokes. Um, we're kind of going through this reconciliation bill debate right now, especially the CEPP. That's most important for West Virginia, I would say. And we've been the object of a lot of derision from those representing kind of bigger states or bigger cities or whatever it may be. And so just over the years, that has really inculcated a lot of animus kind of going both directions. Do you guys have a similar experience in Kansas or uh, just kind of describe the, the average Kansan attitude towards the coast? Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely the same. Um, and I think it goes back to maybe not the founding era of Kansas, but you know, the post civil war era. Um, so it's not just a modern political context, but it is, I mean, there is a, has been a very big progressive and populist streak in Kansas politics going on 150 years now. And that is very much alive and well uh, today. Um, so it's not just a modern context of, oh, it's, you know, you're talking to the Lemon Governor think tank, you know, here in Kansas. Uh, so, of course, we don't like D.C. There is, you know, it's um, it is a an overriding theme of Kansas politics in one way or another. You know, they've tried to seat different legislatures at different times based on progressive politics back in the late 1800s or the early 1900s. Um, you know, it's extractive or uh, agricultural industries versus you know, bankers and Wall Street and whatnot. And that uh, very much continues uh, right through to today. Um, and one of the things that's interesting, again, is it's almost not necessarily even just towards D.C. or L.A. or the coasts, as it were. It's um, even within the state where you have people in the Kansas City area. Johnson County is, you know, the big leafy suburb of, of the Kansas City metro area. Um, and I don't think it's too far of a stretch to say the other 104 counties, generally speaking, look at Johnson County the same way that maybe as a state, we look towards D.C. or Wall Street or something like that as well. And again, with the caveat of what you said at the outset of your question, it's we're painting in the broadest strokes here, right? You can't generalize too much, but there is very much that theme in Kansas culture and Kansas politics. I, I remember it's been several years ago at this point, but I was working for another organization. I was researching just kind of the sociology of the left and the sociology of the right to the extent there is such a thing. And one of the earliest books I can remember coming across was a book called What's the Matter with Kansas? Are you familiar with this, James? Yes, I am. It's been years since I've read it, but I am. I have read it and I am very, very familiar with the general thesis. Yeah, by, by Thomas Frank and, and the general thesis again, from more of a, this was being written from a left-wing perspective, kind of analyzing the right. But his general question was, why do poor white people essentially vote against their interests, right? Which is, why do they vote Republican, essentially was what Frank was saying, in that, you know, Republicans tend to want to see a reduced size of government. They want to see a reduced welfare state. They want to see work requirements instated for um, food stamps and things like that. What, what is your general response to that, to the extent that you have one? And, and kind of in Kansas policy circles, how was that book viewed? So I, the view, 
so we wrote a book actually on the, if you'll forgive the shameless plug back to the tax debate um, about the lessons to be learned from that Kansas tax debate of 2012. And it was what's really the matter with Kansas. So it's a trope that you see and, you know, people twist that title to serve their interests. So it is very much part of kind of the political consciousness in the state. Um, but I, so KPI, you know, does economic and education policy, you know, exclusively, uh, probably not dissimilar from Cardinal, but I mean, that entire, the conceit of that book is that it, you know, kind of ignores the other half of what makes those people, you know, who they are, their local communities, their churches, their cultural, you know, commitments and whatnot. Um, that is a big part of that debate as well about what is, you know, quote unquote, the matter with Kansas that Frank just completely ignores. And this probably isn't dissimilar from West Virginia as well, where you have folks who, you know, were maybe born and raised in, in a state, but then as soon as they can leave, they do. Um, and they go to live, you know, uh, a different kind of a life in, you know, a big city or, you know, even on a coast and, um, trade on their roots, but don't actually still live and work in the state. Um, so it makes it hard to take their, their cultural critiques too terribly seriously for somebody who doesn't, you know, continue to drive through the state as they're going about their daily work. They may come back to visit, um, but they're not, they're not living here. They're not feeling it in the same way. You mentioned a couple times young people kind of leaving for other places. Are there a few areas that are more likely than not to kind of benefit from the Kansan brain drain? Just curious. You mean as far as going to specific states? Yeah. So like, for example, West Virginia is has a smaller population now than it did in 1950. And it's like that for a lot of places across the country that are that are rural in nature. And they tend to end up in a few places, D.C., Columbus, Ohio, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Charlotte, North Carolina. Are there any kind of clusters or congregations for Kansas in a similar way? Yeah, absolutely. So, and it is, I mean, you're close enough to the East Coast, right, that your clusters are, you know, moving to D.C. or what have you. Um, For us, a lot of it is Missouri because of that Kansas City metro dynamic. So they're not really leaving, you know, home, so to speak, in some cases. They just, you know scooted across state line 10 miles and now they're Missourians, not Kansans anymore. Um, but then aside from that, it is a lot of people uh, going to Texas uh, um, is, you know, the Dallas Metroplex and whatnot. Again, it's, it's still regional movement, but you're, you know, you're moving either down 135 or east on 70 as a general proposition. And then there's a smattering of other places um, as well. But those are the two biggest ones, Missouri and Texas. Okay. Yeah, that makes that makes a ton of sense to me. I thought maybe Chicago, but a lot of people don't want to go north necessarily. No, I mean, and yeah, so then you see other folks, you know, I mean, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, you know, bigger cities, right? Denver's close. So yeah, you're seeing, uh, I can't remember if I said this earlier, but on one hand, you're seeing the depopulation of the plains, but you're seeing the urbanization of the plains at the same time. Um, so yeah, it's people migrating to those other bigger metropolitan areas within the region. Um but yeah, most people, you know, don't want to go to Chicago for the winters. Um, so they're, they're heading south and, and east as a, or even west to Colorado as opposed to heading north. Now, we've, we've discussed the urban-rural divide a few times here. And let's discuss it from an intra-Kansas perspective. So me as an outsider, I have some familiarity with Kansas. James, you probably don't even know where New Strong, Kansas is, do you? New Strong? No, I, I'd be lying if I said I did. My I, uncle lives in New Strong. He has lived there for decades. I have visited him a couple of times. Do you know where Burlington, Kansas is? Uh, a little bit, but again, I, I am not going to say I am an expert. <laughs> I'll go one size city up in his little region. I bet you know where this is. Emporia? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. So that's all in the Emporia area. And right. so I have I have limited familiarity with Kansas, but when I think Kansas metro areas, I don't really think Kansas City. I think Wichita, I think Topeka, I right. think even Lawrence to some extent. Do I have that generally or directionally correct? Yeah, I think so. And then the other areas that I would say are um, 
But we can talk about the Topeka Lawrence, Kansas City thing in just a half a second, because I think that is interesting. But then you have those secondary cities, like you said, Emporia, um, the Pittsburgh, Fort Scott area down in the southeast of the state serves as a decent sized metropolitan area with Joplin, Missouri. Um, and then you have areas like Hayes and Salina in central and western Kansas. And then again, those metropolitan areas of Garden, Dodge, and Liberal that are, you know, very ag heavy out in southwest Kansas as well. Now, you alluded to the Topeka Lawrence thing. Let's go ahead and dive into that. What do we have going on there? So, the Kansas City, which you said you don't, you know, count it as a metro area, so to speak, as in your personal tally, right? Is uh, it, Kansas City has spread west enough that it has almost kind of quote unquote captured Lawrence. And then Lawrence, um, which is where the home of the University of Kansas is, almost then has captured Topeka. So you, which is the state capital, um, and it's a company town, but the company is is state government, right? There used to be some, you know, some rail work there, um, shipping, you know, railways, right, kind of a thing. But it is, I mean, it is a government town, um, state capital, you know, this kind of a thing. Um, but it is almost part of the Kansas City metro at this point. I mean, some people may quibble with me on that, but I mean, I know plenty of people who commute from Western Kansas city into and out of Topeka every day. That is very, very interesting. And I've noticed one thing you mentioned Lawrence and one you didn't mention was Manhattan. Yep. Um, And so let's group those together along with Wichita and those places. What is the dynamic like between kind of rural Kansas and urban Kansas and feel free to take that wherever you want to James, that could be as it manifests at the state capital. It could be as it manifests just kind of in the, the culture of the state and the opinion pages, but like, what is the dynamic between rural and urban Kansas like? So I will say this as an urban kid who grew up in kind of that leafy Kansas city suburb. And when I went to Kansas state university, which is where Manhattan is that you mentioned, um, I thought that was Western Kansas, right? And it's most decidedly not. Um, It's two hours, give or take West of the Kansas city area. And it's rural, but it is not Western Kansas by any stretch. I mean, we drove to Colorado on I-70 when I was a kid for different stuff. Um, But the first time I went to visit my wife's family's farm, which is not anywhere close to I-70, and was just like, yeah, this is Western Kansas. It is an entirely different beast. Um, But then, you know, that doesn't get into the urban-rural divide because there's a big part of the state that, you know, may be within an hour or two of Wichita or Tulsa or Kansas City or what have you. Um, So some of this is out of pretending to be a rural kid. Um, Now when I go out to the farm to hunt or fish or what have you, or to, you know, try to get in the way during harvest is there is a very much an urban rural divide. Uh, I alluded to it earlier between all 104 counties, you know, kind of looking sideways at anything coming out of Johnson. Uh, But then, like you said, you know, if, if even, rural life in an Emporia, right, which is a college town, or Manhattan is going to be different than rural life in a community where you're not, you don't have that kind of, uh, you know, a big urban anchor, so to speak, um, that, you know, drives the entire county. I mean, in, you know, I was looking it up and preparing for this again, you know, but you know, in 1890, they declared the Kansas frontier closed, right? Based on more than two people per square mile, I believe it was. And now we have counties in Kansas that are back below that threshold um, that are just completely depopulating. Now, these are folks out, you know, on the Colorado, Kansas line. But I mean, that gives you a, a sense of what rural means. It doesn't mean you've got a college town of 30 or 40,000 people, you know, in a county and then it's rural. It is, there are towns of 900 people. There were 20 some kids in my wife's graduating class from her high school. Um, and that's, that's rural. That's a small town life. And those challenges are going to be very different than even an Emporia or a Dodge city is going to be let alone, um, you know, a, a town like Salina of, you know, 25 or 30,000 people, um, it's, it's, it's diverse in the sense that the economic challenges facing these different communities are incredibly different 
uh, across the state. So I have a little bit, and I mentioned going out and visiting my uncle, and this is another slight off ramp here. I have a little bone to pick with Kansas. I was driving to Colorado Springs one time with my dad. We're going to go do some hiking out in the Colorado mountains. And as we're kind of entering the Western plains of, of Kansas, I start seeing these elevation signs and it is flat as can be. But next thing I know, I'm seeing elevation signs that are 4,000 feet. Yeah. And 4,000 mm-hmm. feet east of the Mississippi. And you're in some pretty rugged Appalachian, Black Mountain, Great Smoky Mountain terrain where it's very clearly you're high up somewhere. Kansas, it wasn't like that. It was just completely flat. What's up with that, James? So we, it is a nice, gentle rise from kind of uh, the Flint Hills that run, you know, north-south uh, through kind of the eastern third of Kansas or at the, the you know, kind of if you're breaking Kansas up east to west in thirds, they kind of run across the, the eastern third of the state. And from there, it is nice and flat, but it is an ever gentle incline until you get up to Denver. Um, and you start, you know, getting into more rolling hills or even the foothills kind of a deal. Um, and Mount Sunflower is our highest point. Um, and I don't think you'd know it if you didn't have that elevation sign, uh, because it's just about as flat as the rest of the state. Um, it just happens to be the highest point in an otherwise very gentle slope as you drive east to west across the state. Yeah, that absolutely blew my mind. And on the East Coast, if you're at 4,000 feet, you're pretty, you're at some pretty nice ski resorts. <laughs> so it was a completely different uh, experience because my own experience was either kind of the Appalachian Hills, which they tend where you are, they're anywhere between 25 and 6,800 feet elevation, but they're always rugged. They're always right on top of you. So I'm in Western Kansas and I'm seeing elevation 4,000 feet. It just completely blew my mind. Yep. Um, but anyway, let's get back into kind of the urban, the urban rural stuff for, for just a quick second here. Are there, what are some unique differences, especially among the larger cities in Kansas? Are, are they known for certain things? Is there a certain stereotype that each one of those cities kind of possesses? Just uh, maybe that three or that top three or four city ranking. What uh, what are some interesting distinctions between them? Right. So the the biggest city in Kansas is Wichita, right? Which again is where I sit. It is, I mean, what you'd think of as kind of a uh, a regional, you know, kind of cultural and economic uh, area. Um, but you know, by historical happenstance, it was also you know the air capital of the world because. Uh, Cessna and Beechcraft um, and a lot of other, you know, early aerospace companies um, happen to be here. Um, So that's kind of, you know, and it anchors kind of the south central part of the state. Um, And it's, you know, very ag dependent, as you would expect, you know, with with banking and, you know, uh, things of this nature, you know, hearkening back to, to those to those days and still going on. Then you've got the Kansas City area, which is the biggest area of the state. It's just it doesn't actually have the not the biggest, the highest population, but it doesn't actually have it's just split across so many different counties and communities and indeed across two states. Um, And then you've got kind of Topeka. But again, that is primarily at this point a, a government town. And, you know, so I grew up in the Kansas City area and, you know, we looked you know, kind of like as a little brother to St. Louis across the state. And I now having lived in Wichita for over a decade, I, I, I don't mean to tell stories, you know, out of the family here, but uh, um, Wichita kind of looks sideways at both Kansas City and Oklahoma City as kind of like, well, we're just as good as them. And, you know, kind of feels like we have to, you know, punch above our weight class to 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 rate with uh, a Kansas City or an Oklahoma City kind of an area. All right. Interesting. Very interesting. So let's get a little bit more into the policy just really quick here. One of the things that I think President Trump did or or former President Trump was really try to, I I think, help the planes out. Is is that fair to say? Yes and no, um, in the sense that Kansas has always been a very international trade dependent economy because of ag and because of the aerospace legacy down here in the Wichita area. So on one hand, some of those trade policies um, really did hurt Kansas uh, ag producers and whatnot. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you know, that 
it also came with some increased um, farm subsidy programs and things of this nature. So I'd say it was a mixed bag. Um, but, it, you know, we talked about it a little bit earlier with Frank. I mean, it, Trump, for all of his foibles, um, which isn't the place on this podcast to talk about him, uh, he did tap into kind of that cultural divide, call it urban rural or what have you. Um, the forgotten places of America is what he absolutely tapped into. Um, and that is, and that theme is very much um, alive in a lot of, you know, Kansas culture and politics to this day. But it was a mixed bag, a mixed bag economically, despite you know him uh, maybe touching a nerve uh, where other politicians had tried and failed to do so. Yeah, and you've, you've kind of anticipated my question here a little bit, and, and you know, feel free to go as deep or as shallow on this as, as you want, but. <sighs> The, what's the general consensus of, of Kansas towards Trump? Net positive, net negative? Uh, just kind of walk me through that to the extent you're comfortable. Yeah, so polling would tell you it's net positive, right? His approval ratings are still you know, quite high, generally speaking, in the state, um, but probably not dissimilar from lots of other places. He also very much divides opinion. Um, and those opinions are calcifying over time, I feel like. Um, when people think of Kansas, um, they think of it as a red state, right? We haven't sent a Republican or excuse me, a Democratic senator to the United States Senate since the Great Depression. Uh, but at the state level, our politics is very, very purple. Um, we had Kathleen Sebelius was the governor before she went to go work in the Obama administration. We have a Democrat governor right now. You know, we had some, you know, moderate to even liberal Republican governors before, you know, Brownback was there. So at the state level, um, our politics is very purple, uh, but federally. So then into your question, you know, Garrett, it's um, Trump is still viewed favorably at the federal level, you know, as, as when people think of Kansas in kind of that red state tradition. Uh, but if you want to drill down into that state level politics and then you know, where KPI's work is on the policy implications, it's still very much a purple, purple state. You know, and honestly, this is one of the first, this is one of the few times we've actually talked about President Trump on this podcast, but at least from a West Virginia perspective, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts from Kansas, is it was almost regardless of what the average West Virginian felt about President Trump's policies, it was the fact that a lot of West Virginians felt like there was finally somebody in the White House that had their back, even if his conception of their back was maybe wrong or whatever. But it was finally somebody that was that understood, at least rhetorically, and appreciated and respected, let's just say, the, the coal mining person, right? Which we've had a lot of presidents that have derided coal, a lot of uh, administration officials, officials that I've talked about the deplorables or guns and religion, whatever, wherever we want to go with that. It was a similar sentiment in Kansas. Was it a feeling that finally somebody kind of gets us or at least respects what we do for the country? Yeah, that that's absolutely the case. And like I said, I mean, you know, Trump, uh, you know, very much tapped into that populist vein that is always part of American politics, but in a state like Kansas, um, that populist theme and even a progressive theme, you know, going back to, you know, the Teddy Roosevelt's and William Jennings Bryan version of progressivism um, is still very much there. And he absolutely put his finger on something um, in a way that lots of other politicians, um, you know, failed to failed to do so. All right, let's get into some more of the, the culture questions. We're, we're winding down here, but I, I always love asking this question. Are there... Any books or artists or paintings or television shows or whatever it may be that you feel like do a really good job of just portraying Kansas or the Great Plains, anything like that? Yeah. That you would recommend I mean, people check out? So people, if you're interested in this, I mean, you have to read the Little House on the Prairie books um, by Laura Ingalls Wilder. I mean, part of that, as they bounced around kind of what was then Frontier America, um, they, you know, had a spot in Kansas. Um that captures it very, very well. Um, you, you've preempted one of the things I was going to say is uh, what not to read is what's the matter with Kansas. Um, because it, I just don't think it is uh, entirely accurate. Um, there's a little uh, Swedish community in Lindsborg, Kansas. Um, and 
if somebody Googles this, you don't necessarily know the name, but when you see the art, you'll know it. And it's Sansen, uh, Sven Berger Sansen, who ha- has a gallery. He was on the um, art faculty at a, at a small uh, college that still exists in Lindsberg. Um, and if you Google him, you'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I recognize that guy's art, even if you wouldn't necessarily recognize it as Kansen per se. And just so, just so listeners are aware, you spell Sanzen, S-A-N-D-Z-E-N. Yes, sir. Uh, that is a heck of a name, Burger Sanzen. I like that. Yep. Yep. Um, good. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say a good, you know, Swedish. It still has, I mean, it is Little Sweden is the name of the town, and it it is uh, a lovely little place. still has a great little college in it and is fun, but it is, st- everybody who lives there is still, you know, blonde-haired and uh looks like they're straight, uh, you know, off of, uh, you know, a Scandinavian uh, calendar or postcard or something. <laughs> straight out of central casting, huh? Yeah, that's exactly right. They're all tall, <laughs> blonde, you know, chiseled features, high cheekbones, that kind of thing. No, I did not know this either, but William Burroughs died in Lawrence, Kansas. Is that right? Uh, that That is news to me. Um, well, I just, that is, you know, you think William Burroughs, you think the beatnik generation, you think Jack yeah. Kerouac on the road, uh, he and Jack Kerouac are sort of maybe Allen Ginsberg along with them, but sort of the, the fathers of the beatnik generation, which sort of rolled into the hippie generation. Although if you, if you would have asked Kerouac, he would have punched you in the face for, for uh, suggesting such a thing. But yeah, William Burroughs died in Lawrence, Kansas. Who knew? Right. And well, obviously I didn't. Um, no one would call me, you know, beat Nick adjacent though, either, uh, to be quite honest. Um, but Lawrence, Kansas, I mean, Lawrence is, it's the home of the university of Kansas. You know, it is, um, has been and remains kind of, I mean, you know, we joke around about it being, you know, like Berkeley or something like that. And it, it may not be quite like that kind of a community, but it still very much has that vibe. So now that you say that it doesn't necessarily surprise me. (laughs) <laughs> All right, just a, a couple of questions left here. Um, so if you were just going to, let's say somebody is coming to Kansas, they've got three or four days to spend. What does the ideal vacation look like in Kansas? Where do they need to go? What do they need to see? And, and what do they need to eat? So um, part of it say, I mean, you know, we believe in freedom. So it, I, I would ask the person what their interests are, right? And then I would try to direct them accordingly. Uh, but if you're coming to Kansas, I mean, the thing that you have to see is the the Flint Hills of Kansas. They go from Nebraska to Oklahoma, you know, right across a line at about, again, the third of the, of, from Kansas city. So it's very drivable. And if you spent, you know, a couple of days either coming into or out of Kansas city or Wichita, and then spent again, a day or two through the Flint Hills, it's one of the last stands of the tall grass prairie in America. Um, the, topography and kind of the geology of it means that it never was plowed under. Um, so it's still grazed, uh, and burned every year in many cases to kind of keep the prairie grasses, uh, growing. And it is absolutely stunning. You wouldn't think you are in Kansas. If you're in the middle of the Flint Hills, you would think you are, you know, kind of in a Colorado, uh, foothills kind of a deal with, uh, ranches, uh, you know, beautiful sunsets and and grazing and whatnot. So um, there's a big symphony in the Flint Hills every year. It's an outdoor symphony. It is glorious. You know, there's the Walnut uh, Valley um, flat picking championships for those folks, you know, West Virginia listeners, you you like bluegrass, right? Um, So that's uh, kind of adjacent to the Flint Hills as well. So lots of good music uh, through that region also. No, I just Google image Flint Hills, Kansas, and trust me, folks, when I tell you, like, that's what you think of when you think of prairies. Yes, it is, yes, it is. <laughs> it's absolutely yes, it is. gorgeous. So I will second your recommendation, my friend. Right. And if you're, I mean, if you're visiting your uncle, you know, around the Emporia area, um, you're, you're right there in it. And uh, there's, you know, plenty of just beautiful hikes. We take the kids as much as, you know, we can uh, press them into uh, walking, you know, with the promise of ice cream or something at the end. Um, and there's still, you know, some, some bison herds that are not wild by any stretch, but are very much worth, worth seeing also. Yeah. It's just, it's the kind of place where you imagine yourself just sitting, the air blowing gently through your hair and you're just kind of contemplating your existence, you know? Yeah. And it, it, it does not blow gently though. I would be remiss if I didn't point out that, um, Kansas 
is not known for gentle winds. Um, it is, there's usually a, a pretty sharp wind. It's just a matter of in the winter, it's out of the north, and in uh, the summer, it's out of the south. And I have to say, whenever I was visiting him, it was ungodly hot. I did not know Kansas got to like 105, 110 regularly in the yeah. uh, in the summer. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely it does. Um, it Now, again, if you're out, you know, at those points of western Kansas, you know, where your elevation is starting to tick up into the 4,000 4, feet, it cools off a little bit in the evening because of the elevation. You wouldn't, again, you wouldn't think of that necessarily. Um, but I mean, yes, we routinely are in the upper 90s through the summer, and we always have a couple few weeks where you are above triple digits. Um, and it gets pretty oppressive. It feels like you're outside and somebody's got a, uh, you know, a hairdryer blowing in your face. Yeah, I'm, I'm just chuckling because that's exactly what it felt like was it was a, a hairdryer. All right, James, so – are you optimistic? Are you long the next 10 years in Kansas? Are you short? I mean, kind of what are your prognostications on what the future holds for Kansas? Yeah, I'm long, but I also would take a longer time frame. I mean, this is a buy and hold kind of an investment. Um, you know, as you know, we talked a little bit about it earlier, how, you know, dependent of Kansas economy is on trade in one way or another, international trade in one way or another. But yet through the pandemic and kind of, um, you know, even before that, some of the international trade questions, um, you know, have harmed some of that in different ways. Um, so I am long-term a buyer of Kansas, um, even if I think not, and probably not just dissimilarly from West Virginia or other places, some of those near-term challenges, supply chains, COVID, you know, runaway government spending and inflation, just to name three, um, are going to make maybe for some bumps here, but it's nothing that we haven't overcome in the past and nothing that we won't be able to overcome in the future. I, I'm sorry. I lied. That was not my last question. I, I meant to get this in. Well, right. so no, apologies no. if it's slightly out of place, but is there one particular state that you guys really have a rivalry with? Is it Nebraska? Is it Missouri for obvious reasons? Just kind of, I always get a, a kick out of the, the regional rivalries between states. So um, it, I would have said it was Nebraska, but then when they bolted for the big, uh, the big 10, you know, that kind of took some of the sting out of that. Um, so, but it is absolutely Missouri. Um, and again, that goes back to kind of the founding period when Missouri was a state and folks were coming across state line to try to, you know, force us to be a slave state and, you know, burnt the city of Lawrence. And <laughs> I mean it, so it, and now it, dictates so much of that Kansas city metro area dynamic. I mean, there's still a road called state line that goes to the Kansas city area. You have economic development, people handing out government subsidies, poaching businesses back and forth across state line. So it is very much Kansas and Missouri is where that rivalry lies. Fantastic stuff. Thank you. James Franco, president of the Kansas policy Institute value investor in the long-term future of Kansas. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today on this episode of Forgotten America, my friends. Absolutely. I've visited West Virginia. It's a great part of the world um, and uh, have actually rafted on the uh, New River. So enjoyed uh, that part of the world as well. So thank you for having me on. Absolutely, sir. It's been a pleasure. Take it easy. Thanks for joining us for this week's conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to Forgotten America wherever you get your podcasts. If you liked this episode, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you would like to support the production of this podcast, you can become a patron of the Cardinal Institute on Patreon or donate at www.cardinalinstitute.com slash donate.